Welcome to Lesson 8F, Conformal Mapping in Potential Flow. In this lesson, we'll discuss the CUTA condition for airfoils, we'll define conformal mapping, and I'll demonstrate conformal mapping with the Joukowsky transformation. First, a quick review. When we add gamma A, the aerodynamic circulation, to flow over a cylinder, the streamlines look something like this, and the circulation leads to a lift. The lift per unit span into the page was rho u gamma a, but there was no drag. Although I did this example with the circular cylinder, it applies for any 2D closed body. This is the Kutta Joukowsky lift theorem that for any 2D closed body, drag is zero and lift per unit span is rho u gamma a. Even for some arbitrary body with circulation added, the streamlines will look something like that. And again, you'll generate a lift per unit span as rho u gamma a. Let's apply this to airfoils. If we have some airfoil at an angle of attack in a uniform stream, for the case where gamma a is zero, in other words, there's no circulation, the streamlines would look like this where the flow has to go around this sharp corner. The speed there is actually infinite, so the location of this stagnation point is not correct. The Kutta condition says that the flow must come smoothly across this trailing edge. So for the case when gamma A is not equal to zero, but rather some positive value, the streamlines look more like what you would expect with the flow coming smoothly past the trailing edge. At this proper value of gamma A, our lift per unit span is rho u gamma a. Now let's introduce conformal mapping. Conformal mapping can be defined as the use of a complex function to transform one flow pattern to another in a different complex plane. This is best illustrated by an example. In fact, the only transformation I'll mention is the Joukowsky transformation. I collected all the alternate spellings of this Russian name Joukowsky some people spell it with an I on the end. Some people leave out this H, while others make a more phonetic spelling, Joukowsky. From what I've read, this is the proper way to spell his name. Conformal mapping involves two complex planes, the zeta plane with coordinates xi and eta, and the z plane with coordinates xy. In both cases, the horizontal axis is real, and the vertical axis represents the imaginary component of zeta or z. I'll use this double arrow to indicate that we're transforming from one of these planes to the other, and you could go either way. We call this mapping or conformal mapping. Zeta is psi plus i eta, just as z is x plus i y. The Joukowsky transformation uses the transformation function z equals zeta plus b squared over zeta, where b is some constant, which will typically set to 1. This is the Joukowsky transformation. Let's do a conformal mapping example using this Joukowsky transformation. Namely, let's draw a circle in the zeta plane with radius a and let a equal b and think about how this transformation will map this circle into the z-plane. Well, this circle is given by zeta equal b e to the i theta, for theta ranging from 0 to 2 pi. In other words, all the way around the circle. Well, the transformation, when we plug in this for zeta, gives us z equal b e to the i theta plus b squared over b e to the i theta, which we can also write as b e to the i theta plus e to the negative i theta, since this term is in the denominator. Well, you should recognize this as twice cosine theta, since cosine theta is e to the i theta plus e to the negative i theta over 2. Thus, z is 2b cosine theta. What's interesting about this is that it's real in the z-plane, which means that all points on the circle in the zeta-plane, even though they're complex, must map onto the z-axis or the real axis of the z-plane. We can look at various points to see how this maps. At point A, theta equals 0, cosine theta is 1, therefore z equal 2b. I'll call that point A prime on the z-plane. Similarly, at point B, theta is pi over 2, cosine theta is 0, so z equals 0. B prime will be here. You can do this for various points c maps to c prime at negative 2b, and d also maps to 0 on the z-plane. 
Thus the circle in the zeta plane maps through the Joukowsky transformation into a flat line from negative 2b to 2b in the z-plane. What's really cool about this is that if we have a flow like a free stream flow in the z-plane, which are just horizontal streamlines, where our complex velocity from a previous lesson is just w equals u times z, if we map backwards into the zeta plane onto our circle. Every point on this line maps to a corresponding point on the circle. The streamlines also map and they look something like this, which is flow over a circular cylinder. Mathematically, the complex potential in the zeta plane, w of zeta, must be the same as the complex potential in the z plane. This is the key to conformal mapping. In our case, with the Joukowsky transformation, z is zeta plus b squared over zeta, so w of z becomes u zeta plus u b squared over zeta. This is therefore the complex velocity for the flow that we map in the zeta plane from this simple flow in the z plane. From now on, we'll let a be a variable and not necessarily equal to b. I also just discovered a mistake here that I'll correct. This is w of zeta, not w of z. If you look back at our notes from a previous lesson, our complex potential in the z-plane for flow over a circular cylinder was uz plus ua squared over z. So when a is radius b, we see the exact same equation, but now in the zeta-plane. Let's look at some other cases where we vary the radius a and zeta naught, which is the center of the circle in the zeta-plane. I'll do some quick examples. Let's let our original circle have radius b. What happens now if we make the circle bigger? And I'll call this radius a. Zeta naught is the circle center. Both of these are centered at the origin. On the z-plane, the Joukowsky transformation maps this into an ellipse. If we have potential flow over this larger circle, the flow maps into potential flow over the ellipse. So this is a rather simple way to get potential flow over an ellipse. I made the original circle dashed to avoid confusion. Suppose we move up in the zeta plane so that zeta naught lies on the eta axis, the imaginary axis, so that our circle shifts upward. The circle is of radius a, where a is greater than b in this case. Well, this turns out to map into an arc as sketched here. Note that for proper application of the Joukowsky transformation, the circle must intersect on the xi axis at xi equal b, which is here. A little bit of algebra and trig gives us this equation for a, where xi naught and eta naught are the coordinates of zeta naught, the center of the circle. This equation guarantees that the circle intersects at the proper place. Let's have some more fun. Suppose we make our circle larger and shifted to the left. Zeta naught is here. Our circle is of radius a, again greater than b. Well, this maps into an airfoil shape, namely a symmetric airfoil. The bigger the circle, the thicker the airfoil. If we shift our circle both leftward and upward, again making sure that we meet the circle at b on the xi axis, the center is now somewhere here, and we adjust A so that the circle intersects at B. This gives us an airfoil that is cambered with the camber line represented as an arc. This is called a Joukowsky airfoil. To predict the flow over an airfoil like this at angle of attack, we also add aerodynamic circulation. We let the flow come in at an angle of attack which we'll call alpha, and we get two stagnation points, being careful that the downstream stagnation point is at b. We do this by adjusting gamma a. The streamlines look the same as we had previously for flow over a cylinder with circulation, except the flow is tilted now. The Joukowsky transformation maps flow over an airfoil at angle of attack, where again we have gamma a, the aerodynamic circulation. Since the free stream is at angle of attack alpha. In both cases, we generate a lift force. In the two-dimensional problem here, it's lift per unit span into the page, of course. And in either case, the kutta joukowsky theorem tells us that the lift is rho u gamma a. It points perpendicular to u, the free stream. If you tilt your head, you can make L go vertical, and we have a pretty cool flow over an airfoil. 
I plotted the Tchaikovsky transformation in Excel, where I plot the zeta plane in red and the z plane in blue. I set b equal to 1, and then I can vary the real and imaginary parts of zeta. When zeta is 0 and 0, and a equal 1, we see the circle and the flat disk. When I set zeta to 0 plus 0.25i, the circle shifts up, generating an arc in the z-plane. Notice that I automatically adjusted the radius a of the circle so that the circle intersects exactly at 1, 0 on this plot. When I set zeta back to 0, but force a to be something different, like 1.4, the circle is larger and centered around the origin, but the z-plane shows an ellipse. If I shift zeta to the left, like negative 0.15, we get this Tchaikovsky airfoil in the z-plane. Notice that a is larger than 1, and it's automatically calculated from this equation. Starting with the previous case, if I shift the circle upward, here by 0.25 in the imaginary plane, the circle shifts up, a is automatically adjusted so that the circle crosses the point 1, 0 on our plot. Now we have an airfoil in the z-plane that is cambered. The trailing edge is always at 2, 0. I can make more camber by increasing this, and I can make the airfoil thicker by increasing the magnitude of this value. In all cases, I adjust A automatically, and the trailing edge is still at 2, 0. Finally, I want to mention the cut -a condition. If gamma a is too small, the rear stagnation point will be on the upper surface of the airfoil. If gamma a is too large, the rear stagnation point will occur on the bottom side of the airfoil. If we adjust gamma a properly, the rear stagnation point occurs at the trailing edge. This is when gamma a is just right. I call this Goldilocks and the three gammas, gamma too small, gamma too large. And gamma is just right. Yeah, that's a pretty poor attempt at humor. Oh, uh, that's what they call a dad joke, Sonny. <laughs> yeah. In closing, I'll make a few comments about conformal mapping and the Tchaikovsky transformation. This is of great historical value. People were able to predict the lift on airfoils, and it actually works quite well. It increases our physical understanding of things such as the cut -a condition, the bound vortex, and how circulation generates lift. But there are limitations. Tchaikovsky airfoils always have a cusped trailing edge. I didn't draw it like this in my previous drawings, but it has a cusp. This is very hard to manufacture, and you would get some severe vibrations with a cusp. Camber is always a circular arc which is not optimum for airfoil design. All the Joukowsky airfoils have the same kind of shape. There's kind of a family of Joukowsky airfoils. But there are much better airfoil shapes out there. Finally, modern-day airfoil design no longer uses conformal mapping. Instead, typically, we just put it on a CFD code. We can then generate fully 3D optimized airfoil shapes. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos. That's all there is to it.